Welcome to Two Messianic Jews. I'm Jonathan. And I'm Eric. And today we're talking about the history and the definitions of Messianic Judaism. Now, this is a tough conversation, so please watch our 12 guidelines for tough conversations if you haven't already. We will also include an outline in the comment section below, but if you really want to know where we're coming from when we address these tough issues, we highly recommend that you watch that full video. The discussion we're having today is one that we really want to hear your feedback, so let us know in the comments or email us at 2 messianicjews at gmail.com. That's 2 with a T-W-O, messianicjews at gmail.com. So yeah, let's get right into it. So Eric, um, how did you understand Messianic Jew and Messianic Judaism growing up? Yeah, so when I was younger, I honestly didn't put too much thought into it, but I was under the impression that a Messianic Jew was simply a Jewish believer in Yeshua, and so then, therefore, Messianic Judaism was just a group of Messianic Jews. So I really didn't give it too much thought past that. Um, what did you think? Yeah, so it was similar for me. I really, the way I explain it to people, um, I had a lot of Christian friends, so the way I would go about it is I would say a Messianic Jew, what that means is that I'm a Jew, but I believe in Jesus. So yeah, it was kind of like I understood that they already thought that by definition, if I believe in Jesus, then that makes me a Christian. So, and that if you're a Jew, you don't believe in Jesus. That's just, that's just the way it is. So I would explain it by just saying, I'm a Jew, but I believe in Jesus, or I, I believe in Yeshua. And that's kind of the way I, I just understood it. And like you, the um, understanding of what Messianic Judaism was, was just the group of people who, who are those Jews who believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. That's pretty much how I understood it. Got it. Yeah, so it sounds like we had about the same experience. And honestly, I think that is the general impression that's out there. Um, and that's actually something that we'll talk about later. How that came to be kind of the general impression of what it means to be a Messianic Jew. But the last few years, as Jonathan and I have researched different ways Messianic Jew and Messianic Judaism have been defined by Jewish believers in Yeshua, we learned that this wasn't always the case. But before we jump into that, I just want to talk first about why do definitions matter? I think definitions matter because of identity formation and communicating clearly who you are and what you believe. If we do not have a strong, coherent definition of ourselves and what we firmly stand by, then misrepresentations of us and our community will continue. We will continue to be confused with Hebrew roots and one law groups. We will continue to be thought of as Christians in Jewish clothes. But more importantly for me, it's a matter of just integrity and honesty in describing who we are as a group and who I am as an individual. And this is necessary for the whole world to see that there is a remnant of Jewish followers of Yeshua who recognize God's loyalty to Israel by continuing to live out our God-given Jewish identity. Absolutely. I, I really agree with that. And I also think that definitions matter because it really gives us a standard by which to live up to. You know, it's a standard for us to aim and it guides us individually and as a community, and it helps us keep from going astray, right? But just to give just a, a caveat on this, um, we're giving these definitions of what we, we're giving a definition of what we think is Messianic Judaism what we think accurately describes a Messianic Jew, which we'll argue and watch the end of the video and you'll see where we, where we stand. But if someone doesn't line up with what we consider to be a Messianic Jew or their understanding of what Messianic Judaism is, we're not here to just to say they have to agree with us. They have to accept what we believe. Now, if someone is identifying as a Messianic and they don't fit our description, yeah, we'll have a, a conversation and it probably is going to be a tough conversation, but I'm not going to force my view down their throat and force them to accept it. Um, this is where we're coming from. This is the, based on the research we've done and where we stand currently. And we just thought we would share this with you and just um, so we can really uh, understand our, ourselves better and kind of just, you know, as we st talked about in our t top 12 guidelines for tough conversations that, you know, thinking is, is talking or talking is thinking. So yeah, we just want to think about this today. Right, so I'm about to jump into definitions of Messianic Judaism as given by Messianic organizations. But yeah, I just want to reiterate what Jonathan was saying. This is definitely not meant to just stir up drama or anything like that. 
We just think this is a very important conversation. And so with that, if you do disagree with us or think that we've misunderstood something, please comment, let us know, send us an email. All right, so jumping into this, I'm going to start with definitions given by the two most prominent Messianic Jewish organizations in America. The first one I'll mention is the Messianic Jewish Alliance of America, or the MJAA. And the definition that they give is Messianic Judaism is a biblically based movement of people who, as committed Jews, believe in Yeshua or Jesus as the Jewish Messiah of Israel, of whom the Jewish law and prophets spoke. And then the congregational arm of the MJA is the International Alliance of Messianic Congregations and Synagogues, the IMCS. So they share that definition of Messianic Judaism with the MJA. They don't give an they don't give a formal definition on their website, but they do have a description of Messianic Judaism in their statement of faith page. So you could check out their website if you want to look into that. But they share that definition with the MJA. So then the next major Messianic Jewish organization is the UMJC, the Union of Messianic Jewish Congregations. And their definition is that Messianic Judaism is a movement of Jewish congregations and congregation-like groupings committed to Yeshua the Messiah that embrace the covenantal responsibility of Jewish life and identity rooted in Torah, expressed in tradition, renewed and applied in the context of the new covenant. So there's a few things to mention about these two definitions. And the first, and maybe the most significant, is that it appears that the MJAs is a descriptive definition of Messianic Judaism. So they're trying to accurately encapsulate the reality of how Messianic Jews and Messianic Jewish congregations are acting currently on the ground and what they believe. Whereas the UMJC, they've stated explicitly in their statements that their definition is a prescriptive definition, meaning they want to create a standard of what Messianic Judaism is for which Messianic Jews and Messianic Jewish congregations to strive for and live up to. And then on top of that, another significant difference is that the UMJC explicitly states their affinity for Jewish tradition. One organization that contains largely, or if not only, um, rabbis and other leaders from the UMJC is Hashivenu. And ha Hashivenu, they're the organization that launched the Messianic Jewish Theological Institute in 2000. And their definition of Messianic Judaism is this. They say, uh, Hashi, this is on their website, they say, Hashivenu envisions mature Messianic Judaism to be an authentic expression of Jewish life that maintains substantial continuity with Jewish tradition. But this is a Judaism that is energized by faith in Yeshua of Nazareth, whom we honor as both the promised Messiah and the fullness of Torah. Mature Messianic Judaism is not simply Judaism plus Yeshua or Yeshua plus Judaism, but an integrated and seamless whole in which discipleship to Yeshua is expressed in traditional Jewish forms and in which the contemporary practice of Judaism is renewed in Yeshua and by the power of the Spirit. So the similarity in all these definitions of Messianic Judaism by these organizations is the belief in Yeshua and the integration of that belief with Jewish tradition. But the difference is the amount of rabbinic tradition and the regard, the high regard for that rabbinic tradition. So, and this should, and this should go without saying, but to those Christians who are watching or listening to the, the podcast, um, know that the Messianic community, um, we hold, we hold as a community that we're saved by grace through faith in Yeshua alone. So the centrality of Torah observance pertains to our covenantal responsibility as Jews. It's not a means of our salvation. Right, right. And it's also important to mention that there's going to be some MJA congregations that do just as much rabbinic tradition. There's some UMJC congregations that are probably less strict along with some MJ MJA congregations. So when you go from congregation to congregation, uh, there is, you know, you kind of get all kinds of flavors. But we do think that these definitions do kind of highlight a slight difference in orientation to rabbinic tradition. 
And so now we'll move on to Messianic Jewish thinkers. And I'll start with Dr. David Stern. He's one of the pioneering Messianic Jewish theologians. Um, And he says that Messianic Judaism is a Judaism which accepts Yeshua as the Messiah. And then Dr. Richard Harvey, he says that Messianic Judaism is the religion of Jewish people who believe in Jesus or Yeshua as the promised Messiah. The difference between these two, David Stern says that Messianic Judaism is a Judaism, so it's within the orbit of the Jewish world. So Dr. Richard Harvey, for the purposes of his dissertation, defined Messianic Judaism essentially as whatever the religious expression of Jewish followers of Yeshua happened to manifest itself as, uh, is what it seems to me. Um, So those are just a few quick notes on those definitions. Uh, Jonathan, you have a few more? I do have one. Rabbi Dr. Mark Kinzer, he says that Messianic Judaism is Judaism in all facets of its teaching, worship, and way of life, understood and practiced in the light of Messiah Yeshua. Traditional forms of Judaism provide the fundamental way of life and thought, but they are all given new depths of meaning through union with Messiah in the Spirit. Yeah, so Dr. Mark Kinzer, his definition of Messianic Judaism, if it sounds very similar to the UMJC definition, that's probably because he was involved in the forming of that definition. Um, yeah, so now we're going to get into other definitions more from lay people, just people within the Messianic Jewish community. And we got these definitions from, uh, uh, from social media. So we made a post on Instagram and Facebook, and so we had people who responded. So uh, Eric, who was the person that responded on Instagram? Right, so on Instagram, we got a response from Yosh Kadosh. Thank you, Yosh Kadosh. Thank you. He says, Messianic Judaism is practicing Judaism within the context of believing that Yeshua of Nazareth came as and still is the Messiah of Israel. The practical outworking of this belief is for Messianic Jews to live out the traditional customs of Judaism and the mitzvot of the Torah illumined by the teachings of Yeshua and his disciples in the apostolic writings while trying to prepare the world around us for God's ultimate redemption and the return of Yeshua. So it looks like Yosh Kadosh here is doing similar things to what we see with UMJC and David Stern and Kinzer. He places Messianic Judaism within Judaism, and he uses this phrase, practical outworking of this belief is to live out the traditional customs of Judaism. So he sees that if a Jewish person does believe in Yeshua as the Messiah, it only makes sense that he lives out the traditional customs that Yeshua would have done and Jews who followed him. And he also adds in this little bit about preparation for God's ultimate redemption um, at the end, which is something that we didn't see in any of the other definitions given before. So thank you again, Yosh Kadosh. And then, Jonathan, I think we got another response on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. So this comes from Mark, and Mark says that Messianic Judaism is Jews and non-Jews worshiping the foretold Jewish Savior, Messiah, and the Savior of mankind. All Messianics are either Jewish or non-Jewish, but seek to follow the Messiah Yeshua as a Jew in most respects, seeing that he observed Passover and all the other feasts and kosher and sabbatical laws, but expanded them. The Messianic will do as well. So what I like about this definition is that, you know, he sees that um, he's focusing an, on Yeshua and saying how Yeshua was a Torah observant Jew and how those Messianic Messianics, those Messianic Jews and non-Jews who are in that community, in the Messianic Jewish community, are trying to emulate Yeshua and trying to live like Yeshua. So uh, one question that I would have for Mark is those practices, the, the Torah commandments that Yeshua observed, um, are Messianic Jews and Gentiles under the same responsibility to observe the same laws, even the laws that are just given for Israel? Um, That's not not something Mark discusses here, but it will be something that we'll kind of um, look into on a later episode, on a later um, episode on this channel. So yeah, excited for that. But yeah, thank you, Mark and Yosh Kadosh, for, uh, for giving us that insight. So now we'll talk about definitions of Messianic Jew. So again, starting with David Stern. He says that a Messianic Jew is a person who was born Jewish or converted to Judaism, who is a genuine believer in Yeshua, and who acknowledges his Jewishness. And then a couple pages later, 
he says, this includes those who call themselves Hebrew Christians, but a narrower definition would exclude them by calling Messianic Jews only those who wish to live a demonstratively Jewish lifestyle, that is, a Messianic life within the framework of Torah. I personally think it is a mistake to confer the term Messianic Jew on just any believer in Yeshua whose parents happen to be Jewish. Mm-hmm. All right, so again, there's a lot there, but just kind of quickly, he first gives a broad definition that he says includes Hebrew Christians, but then he narrows it and gives a more tight definition that he then says excludes Hebrew Christians and constricts it to Messianic Jews who do live a demonstratively Jewish lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And then he pushes against the idea that we began with in saying that a Messianic Jew isn't somebody who just is a Jewish person and believes in Yeshua. It takes something a little bit more than that. So then the next scholar I'd like to mention is Dr. Daniel Jester. He says that Messianic Jew is referring to Jews who follow Jesus and maintain a loyalty to their Jewish heritage. So that seems pretty in line with what we've seen so far. What do you have, Jonathan? Yeah, so uh, I have Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum, and he says that, he says this, what then is a Messianic Jew? If a Jew is a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which we believe to be the proper definition, then a Messianic Jew is a Jew who believes that Yeshua Jesus is his or her Messiah. By faith, Messianic Jews align themselves with other believers in Yeshua Jesus, whether Jews or Gentiles, but nationally they identify themselves with the Jewish people. A Messianic Jew therefore acknowledges that he is both a Jew and a believer. If a Jew accepts baptism solely to lose his identity as a Jew, he is by no means to be considered a Messianic Jew. He is a renegade, a traitor, and an apostate. A Messianic Jew is proud of his Jewishness. He is also proud of his faith in the Messiahship of Yeshua Jesus. So there are things that I I really do like about this definition, and that is that he's kind of highlighting that in the the past, for, for centuries, those Jews who accepted Yeshua as the Messiah, what they were doing was they were converting from Judaism into Christianity, and in the process, they gave up their Jewish identity. Now, he wants to say that those people should not be considered Messianic Jews. And I, I think I think he's right there. They should, as he says, be proud of their Jewishness. He doesn't view the Messianic Jew as responsible or obligated to continue to live his life um, in practicing and observing Torah. Uh, he, he, his view is that the Torah was abolished. So these are issues. These are kind of the nuances um, reading these definitions of what these scholars are saying is a Messianic Jew. And this would be uh, different than, say, um, uh, Dr. Juster's view or Dr. Stern's view when it comes to tor- Torah observance. But yeah, that, that's that's how he would understand a Messianic Jew. Um, yeah, and Eric, if you have anything to add to that, that, that'd be great. Yeah, just so with that, just keep in mind that with Frechtenbaum, we agree Yes, Messianic Jew is proud of his Jewishness, but where we would differ is what that exactly entails. So for him, it doesn't necessarily entail a Jewish lifestyle, observing Torah, a responsibility to observe Torah, as we saw, you know, Stern and Juster and previous definitions Mm -hmm. kind of either said that explicitly or hinted at it. So that's where he has kind of that's where his nuance lies in the midst of all of these other definitions we've we've shared with you. For sure. So the next Messianic Jewish scholar I'll quote is Dr. Richard Harvey again. He says the term Messianic Jew was introduced at the beginning of the 20th century and became prominent in the 1970s as the preferred self-designation of those Jewish believers in Jesus who not only asserted their Jewish identity, but also actively engaged in the formation of Messianic fellowships, congregations, and synagogues. Now, yeah, there, there is a lot I like about this definition, and that is that uh, he's, he's talking about the understanding that these Messianic Jews, the ones that he understands to be a Messianic Jew, are those who are actively engaged in the formation of Messianic fellowships, congregations, and synagogues. Um, really, the synagogue is the place where a Jew, a Messianic Jew, is able to live out his Jewish life, following the festivals, the feasts, observing Shabbat. Um, uh, growing in a community of other Jews, you know, learning Torah, all, all of these things 
are able to be accomplished within the synagogue. So um, I think that's good. I also think it's good that he highlighted um, kind of the history of Messianic Jew and that it was first introduced at the beginning of the 20th century, which which we'll get into later in this video. Um, so yeah, I think I think there's a lot we can learn, a lot to gain from uh, Dr. Harvey's definition. Right. So the next one is Dr. David Rudolph, and he says, consequently, today many people use the term Messianic Jew to refer to any Jewish believer in Yeshua, whereas the historic term connotes a Jew who believes in Yeshua and continues to live as a Jew as a matter of covenant, calling, or national duty before mm -hmm. God. So I really like this statement here. He alludes to the historic term, which is something that you know, we'll get into soon, mm -hmm. but his use of the word or is very nuanced, I think. So, whereas in the UMJC statement, it says like as a matter of covenant responsibility, you know, that's where our motivation for observing Torah lies. But Dr. Rudolph, he's acknowledging that some Messianic Jews, they are observing Torah, you know, with much fervency and joy and passion, some as a matter of covenant, others with an understanding of it being a calling on their lives, and others as viewing it as a national duty before God to maintain, you know, like Jewish continuity and stuff like that. So whereas the UMJC does have this kind of ideal prescription and aim where kind of the uniform motivation is to observe Torah as a matter of covenant, Dr. Rudolph's definition of Messianic Jew does seem to be more descriptive and comprehensive in that when it comes to, you know, any Messianic Jew who you may meet, chances are they fall in one of these three categories of covenant calling or national duty before God as a motivation for observing Torah. The question naturally arises, you know, what caused this diversity of opinion as far as what messianic jew means mm -hmm. and dr david rudolph he offers a couple explanations so we'll offer them here to you today and you can share your thoughts uh, so the first one that dr rudolph offers is that the name change of the hebrew christian alliance of america or the hcaa to messianic jewish alliance of america or the mja as we mentioned was not immediately followed by an official definition of what a messianic jew is leading to thousands of Hebrew Christians who are now overnight members of a Messianic Jewish organization without having to change their Hebrew Christian theology. The second reason that Dr. Rudolph provides uh, to give an explanation of to why there's so much diversity and on the understanding of what a Messianic Jew is, is that Jewish mission agencies, they adopted the terms Messianic Jew and Messianic Jewish, not because they were theologically committed to the original definition of what those terms meant, but because it was more palatable to non-Yeshua following Jews they were talking to. They, they were trying to communicate things to those people, and it was easier, more palatable for them to use this terminology that was coming about from uh, Messianic Jews out of Messianic Judaism. The third reason that Dr. Rudolph proposes is that Christian missionary groups in Israel adopted these terms, Messianic instead of Christian, for the same reasons. And this led to a broader application of Messianic Jew and Messianic Jewish from the, from the past original term to just how it's understood in the large diversity that we see today. So now Eric is going to get into the, the history behind what Dr. David Rudolph's first reason was, and that is the history behind the name change from the Hebrew Christian Alliance of America to the Messianic Jewish Alliance of America. So yeah, Eric, uh, go ahead. So as we've been alluding to and touching on all throughout this show is that there was an original meaning and definition for Messianic Jew and Messianic Judaism. So what were these original definitions? Starting in the late 1800s and early 1900s, in its earliest formulations, Messianic Judaism was understood by its proponents and its opponents as a religious tradition that viewed Jews who follow Yeshua as responsible to retain their Jewish identity, live a Jewish life, and follow God's commandments for Israel found in the Torah. So it is important to distinguish Messianic Judaism from its predecessor, Hebrew Christianity. This is best done by looking at the history of one of the major Messianic Jewish organizations, 
the Messianic Jewish Alliance of America. The original name of this organization was the Hebrew Christian Alliance of America, established in 1915, and the difference is more significant than you may think. Although the members of the Hebrew Christian Alliance of America distinguished themselves from Gentile Christians by adding the adjective Hebrew, they were practically and theologically Christian. They were still members of their churches, of various denominations, and did not seek to be faithful to Torah. And their primary purpose was to convert Jews, quote-unquote, and encourage them to attend churches. So for all practical purposes, they were Christians who were Jews. In fact, they staunchly opposed the small number of members in the organization who felt strongly that Jewish, follower, that Jewish followers of Yeshua should continue to practice Judaism. And Jonathan will share with you an example of one of those proponents. Yeah, so Philip Cohen would be one of these earliest proponents and um, definers of Messianic Jew and Messianic Judaism. And so he had an organization in the early 1900s that was called the Jewish Messianic Movement. And what he ha what happened was there, this, this organization published his article, The Messianic Jew, in 1910. And this is one um, uh, quotation from his article. He says, It is perfectly consistent and scripturally authoritative for Jews to preserve and continue their distinctive nationalism and at the same time be true believers in Jesus as the Messiah. So he goes on in this article um, to use the term Messianic Judaism and what he means by this is he's envisioning Jewish believers in Yeshua following the Torah and living within the orbit of Judaism. And this was radical, okay? He, he was, there was this idea of Hebrew Christianity. There was these Hebrew Christians who were, as Eric says, for all intents and purposes, were Christians. Um, and there was one Hebrew Christian who was very, very upset with this article called The Messian Jew. And he, this guy's name was David Barron. And he said this, he, he, he went on to write an article in response a year later in October of 1911 called Messianic Judaism or Judaizing Christianity. In this article, this is, this is what he said. He said, what these brethren preach and agitate for is that it is incumbent upon Hebrew Christians in order to keep up their quote unquote national continuity, not only to identify themselves with their unbelieving Jewish brethren and their national aspirations, but to observe the quote unquote national rights and customs of the Jews, such as the keeping of the Sabbath, circumcision, and other observances, some of which have not even their origin in the law of Moses. So he's getting really upset. Uh, this, this isn't consistent with what he understands to be Christianity. And what he says, he goes on to say this, he says, to say that it is incumbent upon the Jewish Christian to circumcise his children in order to keep up his, quote unquote, his national continuity is both erroneous and absurd. Now, this is, this is, he's pretty much saying that th this, this is not only terrible, it, it's, it's borderline heresy. Yeah, so I think this is a very interesting case study of the drama that is occurring within Hebrew Christianity. So when you read the primary sources of somebody like Philip Cohen, they'll actually continue to use the term Hebrew Christian and Hebrew Christianity because like they were like they were members of that community. They were looking mm -hmm. to reform it and evolve it into Messianic Judaism. Right. But then David Barron in response just a year later in 1911, he does a very good job of clarifying the difference and kind of demonizes Philip Cohen for taking what he would call a messianic Jewish stance of being so loyal to the Torah. And so while these kinds of debates are happening between individuals within Hebrew Christianity, um, we see that in the third national conference of the HCA in 1917, a similar position to Philip Cohen is formally proposed to the conference. And this proposal is given by Mark John Levy who he was a Jewish minister of the Protestant Episcopal Church of the United States, and he was the general secretary at the founding conference of the HCAA. But he argued that Jewish believers have a right to, quote, exercise their Jewish national loyalty, unquote, by observing, and he thought this was done by observing circumcision, Shabbat, kosher, and Jewish feasts. Most controversially, he argued that Jewish believers who insist that new followers of Yeshua abandon their Jewish heritage are committing, quote, 
an act of unparalleled disloyalty to their race, unquote. So after he presented his paper proposing Messianic Judaism, proposing an affinity for Torah observance, he motioned that the HCAA formulate an official stance on this issue. So the HCAA, during this meeting in 1917, held a vote, and the resolution proposed by Levy was promptly defeated. So according to the conference minutes found in the Hebrew Christian Alliance Quarterly, only Mark John Levy and, quote, one lady voted in favor of Levy's proposal. Then, in the same issue of the Quarterly, the HCAA articulated their official stance concerning Messianic Judaism. And they said this, We felt it our duty to make it clear that we have nothing to do with this so-called Messianic Judaism in any shape or form, nor have we any faith in it. We are filled with deep gratitude to God for the guidance of the Holy Spirit in enabling the conference to effectively banish it from our midst. And now the Hebrew Christian Alliance has put herself on record to be absolutely free from it now and forever. Yeah, so this was a very definitive statement made by the HCAA, to yeah. say the least. One, one which was made by the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And this statement, as guided by the Holy Spirit, stood for only 60 years. <laughs> so in 1975... Not only did the HCAA deem Messianic Judaism a preferred position, but they officially changed the name to the Messianic Jewish Alliance of America, mm -hmm. as we've been discussing this whole show. And so this name change was largely accomplished by the younger members of the HCAA, who, in the wake of the Holocaust, the establishment of the Nation of Israel, and Jerusalem returning to Jewish hands in the Six-Day War of 1967 were very passionate about their Jewish identity and worshiping Yeshua in a Jewish way. So they accomplished this by proposing and voting through this change in the midst of a lot of drama with only a few supporters from the members of the older generation in the HCAA. But this name change marked a dramatic evolution in the organization. And the dramatic turn that this name change symbolized was noticed by people at the meeting at the time and scholars who were studying it very soon after. So one of these scholars is Dr. David Rausch. He was a Christian scholar writing not long after these events were happening. He said, quote, the name change, however, signified far more than a semantical expression. It represented an evolution in the thought processes and religious and philosophical outlook toward a more fervent expression of Jewish identity. And then found in Rausch, who's quoting Daniel Jester from an interview in 1979, so just a few years later, Daniel Jester says, The Hebrew Christian would be a person who sees himself coming from Jewish ethnic origin and may desire to maintain the identity of himself that he has a Hebrew origin, but at the same time, the Hebrew Christian sees himself having come into the new covenant. The old covenant has passed away. So the direct practice of anything Jewish is contrary to his being part of the new people of God in the body of Christ. The Messianic Jew, on the other hand, holds that the Jew is still called by God. It's not a legalistic thing, but it's a biblical calling to maintain his heritage and practice consistent with extolling fulfillment in Yeshua. So Jester actually provides a really good summary of Philip Cohen's, Mark John Levy's view of Messianic Judaism, and David Barron's and the HCAA's view of Messianic Judaism and Hebrew Christianity. And then another example of somebody who was there at the event is Johanna Chernoff. And she says, quote, This proposed name change became the focal issue that represented the differences between the two groups. The old guard Hebrew Christians continued to define their faith as a Jewish-flavored Christianity. They operated from within the church. They accommodated the church, and they ultimately assimilated. The New Guard Messianic Jews saw their faith as true biblical Judaism, centered around Yeshua as the Messiah, and wanted to stand on their own two feet and be as Jewish as the Lord led them to be. So essentially, in short, Hebrew Christians are, as Dr. David Rausch puts it, completely assimilated and church-acculturated Jewish converts to Christianity, unquote, 
which is contrary to the values of Messianic Jews and Messianic Judaism. Messianic Judaism involves Torah observance. This describes a very large number of Jewish believers today, and it describes those who proposed the name change in the 70s, and it describes those who defined the term originally in the early 1900s. So the, the significance of distinguishing between a Hebrew Christian and a Messianic Jew is such that the, it's theological, it's the community you're involved in, and it's a commitment to Torah observance. Those are when it comes down to the historic definitions of what it meant to be a Hebrew Christian versus to be a Messianic Jew. And um, as we talked about earlier in this video, d definitions matter. And so at the beginning, you know, we offered how we used to think that Messianic Jew just meant any Jewish follower of Yeshua. What I hope has become clear is that the purpose in sharing the history of the term and the history of the MJA is that the difference between Jewish believers who go to church and Jewish believers who go to Messianic synagogue and live a Jewish life as a matter of covenant calling or national identity is too fundamental of a difference to call them the same thing. The conclusion I've come to right now is that by identifying myself as a Messianic Jew rather than as a Christian, I'm making a statement about my Jewish identity, my attachment to my people, and my commitment to Judaism. If my faith in Yeshua led me to disregard these things, then I would call myself a Christian, but, but I'm, not, I'm not doing that. I'm a Messianic Jew. Throughout the centuries, both the Christian church and the Jewish community consider a Jew who becomes a Christian uh, to necessarily be a renunciation of Judaism. So, for example, Reformed Jewish rabbi and, and scholar Carol Shapiro, she says this, To become a Christian is to eradicate Jewishness. Indeed, until the last century, most Christian denominations wouldn't have it any other way. And I want to also highlight a point that uh, David Rudolph makes, and he says this, he says, from the 4th century until the modern period, millions of Jews converted to Christianity and left behind their Jewish identity. Similarly, Orthodox Jewish scholar Michael Vishagrad, he says this, he says, if all Jews in past ages had followed the advice of the church to become Christians, there would be no more Jews in the world today. So the, the primary evidence we see of this, of just to become a Christian, is to eradicate Jewishness, as Shapiro says, or to become a Christian is to renounce Judaism, is found really in the writings of early Christian literature. So, for example, Ignatius, who's writing in the second century AD, he is a, a Christian leader, and he says this, So lay aside the bad yeast, which has grown old and sour, and turn to the new yeast, which is Jesus Christ. It is outlandish to proclaim Jesus Christ and practice Judaism. So there's this dichotomy. If you want to believe in Jesus, if you want to embrace Christianity, you need to renounce Judaism. You need to stop practicing Judaism. Another example is much later in 787 AD is the Canon 8 of the Second Council of Nicaea. And what this said is this, since certain erring in the superstitions of the Hebrews have thought to mock at Christ our God, who in private and secretly keep the Sabbath and observe other Jewish customs, we decree that such persons be not received to communion, nor to prayers, nor into the church. And this is just what we see, example after example, and I don't have time to go into all the other examples, but we will, we will be going into those examples in, in a future video. Eric will, will talk about it at the end of this video. So I was, I was having a conversation with a Messianic rabbi about the podcast that Eric and I are doing here, and I asked him a question of, you know, why, why he doesn't call himself a Christian. And, you know, that's, that's kind of an underlying question that we're, you know, we're addressing right now. And the way he responded, I think, was, was helpful. And that is, he says, that words have both denotations and connotations. So think about this. The, the, the word Christian can literally be understood as, as meaning one who follows Christ or one who follows Jesus, the Messiah, Yeshua, that, the, a follower of Yeshua, right? So in that sense, yeah, the, the denotation is that he's a Christian. But words also have connotations, and the connotation is that one has to renounce Judaism. 
that it's not it's no longer Jewish to believe in Jesus. And that's the understanding that both the Jewish community has had for many, many centuries, but also the Christian church, as we've seen in the Second Council of Nicaea and Ignatius and many others that I didn't have time to quote. And even when we're looking from the the transition from the Hebrew Christian Alliance of America to the Messianic Jewish Alliance of America, those Hebrew Christians who wanted to uh, uh, repudiate this idea of Messianic Judaism wanted to repudiate it because it's an embracement of Judaism. It's an embracement of Torah observance to living a Jewish life, Jewish identity. And that's what I'm seeing, that, no, I'm not willing to call myself a Christian. That's not an accurate description of who I am. So in order to distinguish myself from, say, a Hebrew Christian or a Christian, those followers of Yeshua, yes, but I'm embracing my Jewish identity. I'm I'm committing myself to Judaism and I'm identifying with my people Israel. And that is why I call myself a Messianic Jew. Yeah, that's very well said, Jonathan. Definitions do matter. And again, this isn't just semantics. This isn't just overthinking. This is a matter of clear communication of who you are, what you believe, and how you live your life. And so with that, we'd like to share with you guys the definitions of Messianic Jew and Messianic Judaism that we currently hold to and we find uh, a good description of who we are and, and what we believe. A good descriptive definition of Messianic Jew is Dr. David Rudolph's definition, which is a Jew who believes in Yeshua and continues to live as a Jew as a matter of covenant calling or national duty before God. And also the MJAA gives a good definition of a descriptive definition of Messianic Judaism. But we like the idea of having a prescriptive definition, and we think the UMJC's definition works really well. I think this is a really good one. And it is this, Messianic Judaism is a movement of Jewish congregation and congregation-like groupings committed to Yeshua the Messiah that embrace the covenantal responsibility of Jewish life and identity rooted in Torah, expressed in tradition, and renewed and applied in the context of the New Covenant. And to end, I know we quoted a lot of Messianic Jewish scholars, thinkers, organizations, but I really think we should think about the words that Messianic Rabbi Russ Resnick has to say concerning Messianic Judaism. This is what he says. When we imagine our primary community of reference to be the visible church, we must define ourselves within that church by our Jewishness. But when our community of reference is Israel, our Jewish people, and their tradition, we define ourselves within that setting by our loyalty to Messiah. It is more biblically consistent to place ourselves within Israel standing for Messiah than within the visible church standing for Jewish roots. So we know these conclusions are our own. Eric and, and I have, have, have thought about this, and this is where we're at at the moment. And we really want to know what you have to say about this. We really want to learn from you, learn from each other as a community and grow. And um, just th thanks for taking your time to listen to, to the end of this video. And yeah, Eric, what, what do we have next uh, coming up? We thought it'd be good to do a few videos on Jewish perceptions of Messianic Jews and Christian perceptions of Messianic Jews. So I think just how it's important to have self-definition and self-understanding, it's also important to understand kind of where you stand in the midst of those around you. What do Jewish people think of us? What do Christians think of us? Those will be really fascinating. You'll hear some very interesting, surprising, and dramatic perceptions from all of these groups, both ancient and modern. If you're on YouTube, please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell for updates for those upcoming videos. If you're listening to the podcast, please subscribe to get those notifications. Everybody, please follow us on social media. The links are in the description. We look forward to hearing your thoughts on this video. This is certainly one we want to hear from you guys. Thank you again for joining us.